Get up to speed and transform your gaming experience with Blue Yonder Broadband Internet. Welcome to Gamer TV. Coming up, we'll be looking at the latest technology for the small screen, and Tommy Tallarico takes us on a journey into sound. The music's gonna, you know, get your blood going even before you know what's happening. We'll be reviewing Shadow Ops, Red Mercury, Kaina, and Harry Potter, Prisoner of Azkaban. And we'll be previewing Dark Watch, and Thief Deadly Shadows. That's all coming up right after this. Ever loved a game so much that you wish you could be in it? Well, a team of gamers in New York have achieved just that by devising an alternative version of the classic 80s arcade game Pac-Man. Wittily entitled Pac-Man Hatton. This is how it works. Four ghosts and one Pac-Man are each teamed with their own player based in the control room. They stay in touch by cell phone and the controllers can track their players' movements by inputting information into the custom designed software. They can then warn their players if they have to change direction, hide or run. Pac-Man Hatton is so popular that the creators are encouraging people worldwide to stage their own versions. Log on to www.pacmanhattan.com for more details. Don't be surprised if you get more than just sheep rat people coming after you, though. Oh, <laughs> Four news later in the show, time now to unveil the newest games on the block. Coming up, we sneak around with Thief Deadly Shadows. But first, we're on Dark Watch. One of the major disadvantages of being a supernatural warrior committed to defending the Old West from the murderous undead is that the ungrateful blighters you're committed to protect have a nasty habit of staking you while your back's turned. It's true, it happened to Jericho Cross and now he's doomed to wander the towns of the Gold Rush, demonstrating exactly how annoyed he is by shooting people with a variety of big guns. Not the subtlest of plots, is it? Well, never mind. Dark Watch is a violent mixture of cowboys and monsters, and as a result, can be forgiven almost anything. Jericho is half vampire, you see. And while this doesn't mean he has only one fang, it does mean he has exotic powers, like the blood vision that allows him to spot his undead foes. What else will there be? Well, guns for a start, and lots of them. No first-person shooter will be complete without shotguns and sniper rifles and make an appearance before they were invented. Surely, grenades are here too. If you were to sum up the atmosphere of this game in two words, they would be deeply and unpleasant. This version of the Wild West is noticeably free of dashing heroes, free-spirited heroines and obliging horses. In fact, the only creatures not trying to kill you are the ones you've just killed. If you've room in your heart for yet another horror-soaked blaster, you may well want to investigate Dark Watch on its release next year. A review will follow soon. So, what's the most important part of any game? Graphics, playability, longevity? Well, some would argue that the sound is equally important, like this guy. Listen up, Talarico's talking. Tommy Talarico, the hot rod of video game composers, has literally worked on hundreds of video games. But just what goes into creating the sound for a game? We caught up with Tommy in sunny California to hear all about his latest project. 
And one of the big projects I'm working on right now is a game called Advent Rising. All speak of a powerful, highly intelligent race. And um, the, the unique thing that we're doing in this game is that we're really kind of projecting emotion. We're going to cue the music when certain things happen or when certain people are about to appear. So the music's going to, you know, get your blood going even before you know what's happening. So it is true then. We're creating different so motifs and using certain sounds for different characters in the game. You're gonna hear a certain thing and realize, uh-oh, I'm about to encounter the bad guy before you even know it, but you're getting it triggered by the music. These are the Seekers, and they're really scary looking guys. Take like the movie Alien and Predator and like The Omen and all these things and kind of wrap it into one, and that's what these guys are. So what I want to do for that particular music is, I wanted to I wanted to create not necessarily a melody for these guys because they're so mean and intense. What I wanted to create is is a sound, a sound that really creeps you out. So in this instance, I, you know, we're using that kind of the, the string bowing there that You know, and that now kind of becomes our motif or the instrument that we now associate with the Seekers. This is nonsense. On the other side of things, you have the Aurelians. Now, the Aurelians are these, like, highly intelligent, very noble characters. Here's their motif in full swing here. I, I thought of, like, you know, horns because um, that's a very kind of noble type instrument. It's a lot of French horns. And now, when we want to take it to a battle tune... So you can see how by, you know, using a motif, you know, you can, you know, slow it down, speed it up, you know, so it's, it's going to have an interactive effect on the game, which is awesome. But writing the music isn't the only involvement that Tommy has with the video game. One of the things that Tommy Tellerico's Studios does that's kind of unique is we offer the complete solution. We, we offer all of the music, all of the voices, all of the sound design. Creating something, you know, watching a game and coming up with something is great, but to make it interactive and to make it be able to switch and change gears at any time and have it make sense, you know, you have to get your hands dirty, you have to get technical. Aside from the music, one very important technical aspect is the sound design. This is every other sound you hear applied to the action you see in the game. So here's our hero Gideon. You see all the stuff he's doing here? I'll take this, this scene right here, and when he kicks the person, um, you'll see it. So this is Gideon's voice, this track right here. So, huh, boom. And then I, I wanted to start to get a little punch thing and kick thing going. So I got, you know, that's kind of like a, kind of a crunchy thing. And then here's another track that I, that's more of the breaking the jaw type of deal. And then there's this one, which is more of the, you know, the actual impact. And then if you put these three together, you get a really nice, beefy kick in the chops and then add in the huh, and you got something. Okay. So, with the complex requirements of sound design and music, do you have to be an audio expert to do Tommy's job? For the most part, you have a lot of these little faders and little buttons and things, which I don't know what half of them mean, but you know, I just kind of go around and tweak them till, uh, till I get something that sounds cool. So now you know. Review time now on Gamer TV. Coming up, we'll be journeying to the center of the earth with Kyena. And heading to Hogwarts. But first, this is Shadow Ops Red Mercury. Word to the wise. Trust no one. There's no shortage of first-person shooters for the Xbox, so gun-toting new arrivals have to be pretty special to get noticed. 
Atari's Shadow Ops Red Mercury has now marched onto this crowded battlefield. Has it got the vital killer instinct? Campaign mode casts you as Captain Frank Hayden, a harder steel Delta Force operative who must undertake another world-saving counter-terrorist operation. The CIA's Special Missions Unit has headhunted Big Frank to track down the notorious Red Mercury, a substance that gives nuclear warheads an extra devastating kick, like atomic Tabasco. My God. Rather than take a Rainbow Six-style tactical approach, Shadow Ops goes straight for the jugular with frantic bullet-spitting action right from the word go. It feels like being in the middle of an action blockbuster, with explosions going off all around you and your bullet-riddled victims taking spectacular stuntman dives. The impressively lit and textured visuals compound the effect, while the boom in Dolby 5.1 sounds and cinematic score convince your ears. Extensive live multiplayer options are essential for Xbox shooters these days. Red Mercury delivers free-for-all or team deathmatch. Capture the flag and escort the VIP modes accordingly. These are also available split-screen along with 10 cooperative missions. Even with its stiff Xbox competition considered, if you're looking for a high-octane blast, you've come to the right place. Ten clicks coming in on flight. Check. Visual on target, making our run. We'll give it four stars. High marks for Red Mercury, then. Let's see if Kaina can maintain the standards. Unless you know your French cinema, chances are you won't have heard of Cayenne After Prophecy, a dazzling CG fantasy film that graced their cinema screens last summer. This year the film's heading to our shores and Namco have snapped up the rights to the accompanying Cayenne game, which is now available for PS2 in Japan. Kaina is a teenage girl who lives in the twisting branches of Axis, a sprawling tree-like coil in the centre of the planet Astria. Her people depend on the tree's life-giving sap for survival, so when it runs dry, panic sets in and Kaina sets off to find a solution. Gameplay takes the form of an Onimusha-style third-person adventure. As Kaina travels deep into Axis roots, she'll encounter progressively scarier creatures that must be fought off with her daggers and crossbow bolts. Combat is kept simple, with button sequences used to trigger combo attacks. Defeated beasts give off glowing orbs that Kaina absorbs to boost her health, weapon level or berserk meter. It's all well executed, but nothing new. Kaina the game stays true to the film's distinctive style, so it looks and sounds stunning, which goes some way to make up for the lack of gameplay innovation. We'll give it three stars. Still to come on Gamer TV, we go techno with the latest on offer for the mobile world. And we get a first look at Thief Deadly Shadows. See you after the break. Welcome back to Gamer TV. Let's dive straight in with more news. You don't need to sweat axle grease and drink pure petrol to know that there's a racing game coming soon. Gran Turismo 4. Surely no other racer can beat this beast. Well, Konami's Enthusia Professional Racing is going to have a go. The finished game promises hundreds of cars, various track environments and a very intriguing feature called VGS or Visual Gravity System. Demonstrated at a recent press conference, the VGS shows where and how much G-Force is affecting your vehicle, allowing for a realistic physics engine. But will all these fancy features make Gran Turismo 4 eat dust? Hold out for Gamer TV future previews.
From the amount of gung-ho games and the presence of the American army, you'd be forgiven for thinking this year's E3 was for adults only. But Disney and Buena Vista proved that gaming wasn't just for the big kids by showcasing various titles, including the long-awaited 3D platformer Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas, Oogie's Revenge on the PS2. With Nightmare, the game adaptation of upcoming movie King Arthur and Tron 2.0 Killer App all expected before the end of the year, Disney and Buena Vista should have enough to corner the little gamer market. And we're staying with the junior gamer theme for our final review. Time to dust off that wand for Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. While we all wait with interest to see what J.K. Rowling plans to do with her money, like buying her Granite Space Shuttle, for instance, there's a brand new Harry Potter movie in cinemas and now a game to go with it. Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban reunites our three noticeably older heroes for a new adventure, the most striking element of which are the genuinely terrifying Dementors. This is the first Potter title where gamers get to control Ron and Hermione, and unsurprisingly, the switching of characters proves very important. Each student has his or her own abilities. Gentlemen, Ron can see like secret doorways in walls. Hermione can squeeze into the smallest of spaces. And Harry is the only trainee wizard with the ability to jump long distances. This is a puzzle game at heart, and some levels in Hogwarts, which now seems the size of the Death Star incidentally, are merely stylish chains of cogs, blocks and mirrors. That doesn't mean that there aren't some fairly hefty bosses, mind you, and even the smallest of creatures are nicely exotic. As with previous games, the world of the books and movies are lovingly recreated, even if some careless rendering has left poor Professor Snape looking rather like a pig this time round. Despite the suspicion that surrounds all film licenses, Prisoner of Azkaban turns out to be a very well-crafted game, filled with value and imagination. We'll give it four stars. Not that it needs it. We've got a feeling they might sell a few copies of this one. Surreptitiousness. Oh, please, step through, young sir. That sounds better than the film. Anyway, moving on, mobile gaming is now such a huge global business, they even have their own show in Cannes. And guess who was there? Welcome to Cannes, the host of the 3GSM Expo, the hottest mobile technology show on the face of the earth. Girls, gadgets and games, 3GSM had it all. It even had its own fashion show where the latest in cutting edge technology took to the catwalk. But gaming on the go was the order of the day with many of the major developers in the mobile gaming industry unveiling their latest titles. With the impending release of the Engage QD and interest in mobile gaming rising, have mobile phone games grown up at last? If you sat on a train two years ago, you probably saw most people playing Snake. This year, those people are playing Tiger Woods, and they have you know, no idea that it maybe even exists on the PlayStation. So what can we expect to be playing on our phones in the near future? We're on about 18 original titles now. Um, a lot of those, Balloon-Headed Boy, for example, is, is one we've just recently released. Uh, lots of platform games, you spend your entire life jumping around. Balloon-Headed Boy, you can't jump. You, you actually expand your head and you float around the levels. Um, other products we've done, Phantom Mansion is an example. It's a uh, more of an adventure title, kind of puzzly adventure title. Um, you know, lots of lots of levels, lots of lots of rooms for you to, to, to explore, and again, keeping the player involved all the way along. 
but while new games are being made, there are still some very familiar titles being developed for the mobile market. Uh, spin to sell Pandora tomorrow, for example, which is uh, you know, coming next and which will be a huge uh, launch everywhere. So Pandora tomorrow, I think, would be a very, very good game on the phone. The license-wise, we've just done a product with, with Digital Bridges for the, uh, the Fast and Furious license. Um, it's got a lot of features that, that are in the film. Vin Diesel's in there somewhere. You know, he pops up and asks you to race. But how to establish games like these translate to the tiny screen? As it's true that it's a real challenge because, of course, we don't have at all the resources you get on an Xbox. So we have to um, concentrate all that into a, a similar experience. If you play the Sprint to Cell 2D, you will see that, well, the, the phone game has exactly the same uh, spirit of the 3D game. And I think it's what really counts. Mobile phone games are undoubtedly going from strength to strength, but will we see a move from console gaming to mobile gaming in the future? Phones are not sold only to gamers. They are sold to everyone, and then everyone happens to have um, a nice phone and suddenly re uh, uh, sees that, realizes that, well, you can get a game on it. It's cheap, you know, it's uh, just a few quid, and it's a real good experience. And you have it ev all the time in your pocket, so you can play, you know, any moment when you've got some leisure time. One of our uh, most successful games now on Java uh, internally is a game called The Weakest Link. Uh, we now um, see that uh, people not only play the game, but they also now download additional question packs, post their high scores. And this really is the, the future of gaming that we see on a mobile. I think mobile being a communications medium, um, people want to communicate about how well they've done with the game. They also see it different from a Game Boy or a PlayStation game in downloading the next level. So kind of always being connected with the game is, is kind of what we see people want to do. Downloading Anne Robinson. Now there's something I thought I'd never do. Let's wrap it up, shall we? Our final preview, Thief Deadly Shadows. It wouldn't be terribly difficult to work out how much sneaking around would be involved in a game called Thief Deadly Shadows, would it? Answer? Loads of sneaking around. In fact, almost entirely sneaking around. Our hero, Garrett, has to be the least seen video game character since someone suggested the Paulie Shore FPS. It is looking rather fun, mind. This, the third instalment in the series, provides our swiping protagonist with rather a lot of handy gadgets. For example, there are water arrows to extinguish lanterns and fires, flash bombs to blind would-be pursuers, even enhanced vision to give you a better view of the absurdly melodramatic non-player characters. Be protection from the evil of the trickster, from the malice of those who would follow him in their dark forest. This will be the first Thief game where you can view Garrett in the third person. There'll also be a number of ways to play. You can avoid combat at all costs, sneak him from ladder to rafter in an attempt to remain concealed, or else just forget all this noble thief nonsense and start jacking women with iron bars. This is early code of the game, but it's looking fairly glorious so far. Garrett's medieval world is certainly dark and atmospheric, even if most of the voice actors would starve to death in the real world. Hey! There's a thief here! Those are City Watch. They're the guys I have to look out for. IDOS has started advertising this franchise as the forebearer of every stealth game on the market. That may be so, but with the genre nearing absolute saturation point, Deadly Shadows has a lot of high-tech competition. We'll see how it does in the summer. That's all we have for you for this game of TV. We'll leave you with more kleptomaniacal mayhem. See you next time.
to speed and transform your gaming experience with Blue Yonder Broadband Internet.